A warm welcome to everyone joining live today and thank you for those joining us on demand and who will be listening into the session later. My name is Sheila and I'm the head of program for digital finance at Consumers International. Uh, please use the chat function to introduce who you are and from which organization and where in the world uh, you are joining us from. Uh, it is great to have a global representation across our panelists today and in the audience. Uh, you may use the chat function in case of any comments, in case of any questions that you may have for the panel, and we shall be able to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, the session today is Accelerating Fair Digital Finance, Consumer Needs and Risks in the Digital Finance Ecosystem. And this is part of a week of impact-oriented events uh, as part of the Financial Inclusion Week that has been convened by the Center for Financial Inclusion. My name is Sheila, as I said earlier, I'm the head of program for digital finance at Consumers International. Consumers International is a membership organization for 200 plus consumer advocacy groups around the world in more than 100 countries. And our work with members and partners is to empower consumers to ensure that consumers are treated fairly, safely and honestly worldwide and to drive change in the marketplace on global consumer issues including digital access rights, product safety, and sustainability. Uh, with me today in our session, you'll be, you'll be hearing about some of the significant and current digital finance consumer risks, why the voice of the consumer is important to improve some of these risks, what consumers need for a fair and safe digital finance environment, and how solutions can be collaboratively developed to effectively respond to some of these key consumer challenges. Uh, you will also be able to engage with some of the regulatory representatives that are with us today to share what they've done around uh, setting up policies and regulations that are consumer centric to ensure that we have a digital finance ecosystem that's sustainable and fair to all consumers. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce true experts to this panel who will be sharing uh, various aspects of their work and what they've done around ensuring that we do have a digital financial ecosystem that's uh, comfortable and uh, safe for consumers everywhere in the world. And we shall be particularly paying emphasis to the financial uh, ecosystem in low and middle income countries. Now on the panel today, we do have Eric Duflo. Eric leads the CGAP's work on consumer protection from policy, industry, and customer perspectives, ensuring that financial services have positive outcomes for consumers. He is also a senior financial sector specialist and has done a lot of work and authored various articles on policy and regulatory issues, on digital finance, on consumer centricity, and ensuring that financial services have positive outcomes for consumers. Also on the panel, we have Saroja Sundaram, who is the Executive Director for the Citizen Council and Civic Action Group. Saroja leads uh, the Action Group's work as its Executive Director, and <clears throat> in addition, effectively oversees the organization's operations and is responsible, to, uh, responsible for ensuring that consumer protection and uh, various research and various products and uh, issues and consumer issues are brought to the forefront. She's also a strong advocate for issues on consumer protection across various industries, such as telecommunications, uh, real estate, digital finance, e-commerce, uh, to mention but a few. We also have on the panel Sima Shandil, who is the Chief Executive Officer for, Con for the Consumer Council of Fiji. Sima is the CEO of the Consumer Council of Fiji and is a distinguished um, she has had a very distinguished career over 20 years with extensive knowledge in the knowledge in the fields of research, project management, uh, consumer issues, and digital finance. Uh, for the regulatory representatives, we have with us uh, Frank Kajungu, who's the manager for the Financial Sector Conduct and Consumer Protection Department at the National Bank of Rwanda. Frank, uh, his division is in charge of accelerating financial services and consumer protection reforms in the financial sector and has been very key in enacting uh, regulatory reforms that are geared towards making the financial ecosystem safe for consumers in Rwanda. And uh, finally, we do have Kasha Singh, who's the head of policy support department at the Financial Sector Conduct Authority in South Africa. Uh, Kasha is currently <coughs> working on various issues on driving the FSCA's objectives in supporting financial inclusion and transformation 
of the South African financial sector and as well has developed a cohesive and a wide array of cohesive policy approaches in matters of relevance to the FSCA. I'm very thrilled uh, to have you all on the panel. And uh, without further ado, uh, Eric, I'll come to you first to share some of your recent analysis on the global evolution of digital financial services, consumer risks, uh, what you have seen, the changes you have seen around digital finance, the new risks that have come up and what we can do uh, to ensure that we are up to date and are working together to ensuring that these are, are managed. Uh, over to you, Eric. Thank you, Sheila, for uh, managing this panel and thank you to uh, CFI for inviting us uh, to uh, speak today and uh, hopefully also uh, hear from the uh, uh, participants. So, um, yeah, I think we are we are going through a an era with the uh, you know rapid digitization of finance that also creates increasing number of risks. Um, and we have conducted a research that was published earlier this year that shows that uh, even though we've made you know tremendous progress in financial inclusion, as we have seen with the recent FINDEX results. Uh, there are still some very significant issues that we need to tackle when it comes to consumer protection. So we conducted a, a research at CGAP on understanding better the nature of uh, consumer risks in digital finance, and also on understanding better the uh, sort of evolution. Is it growing? Is it diminishing? Is it stable? And what we ended up doing is that we, we classified uh, the consumer risks in digital finance in uh, six broad categories. Uh, one is uh, fraud, the second one is data misuse, the third one is lack of transparency, the fourth one is inadequate redress mechanisms, the fifth one is connectivity issues, and the sixth one is agents related issues. The last two are cross-cutting uh, risks. Now, <laughs> The, the sad story is that we are seeing with all the data that is available globally, is that we're seeing a, an increase globally in all the data we have found in all the regions, all the country for which there was data available. Uh, we found that frauds are increasing everywhere. Um, data misuse is also increasing everywhere. For lack of transparency, we have less information so there are indications also of growth of issues at the global level and at the regional level. And for inadequate redress mechanisms, we have very limited information, only country uh, specific information that is also showing growth. Now, the other thing is that if, just to give you two pieces of data, the, the frightening aspect of this, in my opinion, is that we are seeing that in many cases, the, uh, the growth of risks is going faster than the growth of technology adoption. So for example, as you all know, data is being increasingly used in, uh, in finance to provide financial services to people who were unbanked before. For example, you know, digital credit. Uh, loads of unbanked of, of people who had never borrowed formally are getting into the system through digital credit. Uh, I saw some, some research recently showing that in, I come from a which country, but 60% of, maybe it was in India, 60% of um, uh, people were borrowing uh, digital credit. For them, it was the first time they were borrowing, you know, formally. So, and we're seeing that the data created between 2016 and 2020 has increased by 2.5, has been multiplied by 2.5 in terms of data created. And when we look at data that has been exposed, this has increased five times. So the data exposed is growing faster than the data you know, created. Uh, for the uh, mobile apps, the, the, the share of uh, financial transactions done on mobile, mobile apps has increased by 38% between 2019 and 2020, uh, 2022, sorry, and 83% of increase in the share of fraudulent mobile app transactions. So again, the fraudulent you know, uh, transactions are increasing faster than the uh, 
uh, number of transactions. So that's another concern. So um, obviously, you know, at CGAP, we we want to know the uh, the data so that we can put in place the right policies and tools. Now. I'll be brief, but uh, there are several things that maybe my colleague Grace can share on the chat. So, um, you know, for example, we've put a market monitoring toolkit in place for supervisors and consumer associations because consumer associations are obviously very important players. Uh, these these tools enable supervisors and consumer associations to better understand what the risks are in the market nature and scale of risks so you know we have mystery shopping we have uh, phone surveys etc uh, for example we just did a phone survey in ivory coast showing that 88 uh, percent of digital finance users were had faced a risk in the last 12 months and 40 percent of dfs users uh, lost money uh, likewise we use another uh, markets monitoring tool in uh, india to analyze social media and we found a lot of issues with digital credits uh, consumers there. Um, so th these, for example, misuse of their data for you know uh, uh, debt collection, uh, lack of transparency. So it's very very critical that we use these these market monitoring tools to better understand the situation. Um, and finally, and I don't know if I'll have you know a chance to talk a bit more about it. Uh, we think at CGAP that. If we want to resolve the issue of you know, consumer risks in digital finance, we need to take a ecosystem approach, what we call a responsible digital finance ecosystem approach. And this approach, we believe it is our vision, and we believe we need uh, more collaboration between regulators, different regulators within a country. We need more collaboration between consumer associations and regulators. Uh, we need more uh, collaboration between providers and consumer associations and providers. Everybody needs to collaborate more strongly if we want to get a better consumer protection. We also need more client centricity. Uh, so we believe it's critical that regulations and supervision, for example, are more client centric. Uh, Kershia, who is on our panel, is an expert on this topic in South Africa. Um, and we, we also need capacity because what we're seeing is that in some countries, uh, the you know either the consumer associations or the regulators uh, are behind some of the uh, you know rapid innovation happening in the markets you know the use of cryptocurrencies for frauds for example I heard from colleagues you know working in different central banks and supervisory authorities so it's critical to build this capacity uh, of different actors collaboration and customer centricity for our digital finance ecosystem to become more responsible. I'll stop here. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Very interesting insights. And just uh, uh, following on what Eric has said, uh, Sima, in, in the presentation, Eric has said some of the major risks, the broad risks that we've seen are around uh, redress and, and um, systems for redress and re dispute resolutions that are insufficient but also uh, as part of the FAIR Digital Finance Accelerator's baseline survey, 68% of the respondents did say that uh, redress and insufficient or ineffective uh, customer feedback mechanisms were some of the big challenges and issues that they thought were coming up. He also did speak about some of the importance of using uh, market monitoring tools. And just to speak to that, uh, what, what are some of the tools and interventions that the Consumer Council of Fiji is currently implementing to ensure that consumers have access and are empowered through redress, especially for digital finance products? Thank you, Sheila, um, and thank you, Sia, for you know giving me an opportunity to speak on this platform. Yeah, as um, Eric has highlighted, I think no one is spared uh, with the risk that DFS has created, um, you know, alongside with exhibiting traditional risk. And uh, this risk and challenges coupled with other prevalent issues makes consumers vulnerable. Um, in Fiji, in being a very small um, country, we have seen, uh, you know, in the last few years, especially, you know, um, during COVID and after uh, 
during COVID and now a lot of people have gone online and you know doing a lot of transactions through digital financial space and we could see an increasing number of consumers falling um, victims on digital financial pl platform and if, if we look at the stats in Fiji and the complaints that is this is just the tip of the iceberg I'm going to talk about the complaints that has been just registered with the Consumer Council of Fiji because there's no other platform where we can get the data from so we could see that you know in 2021 uh, we saw the number of complaints increasing to 181 from 34 in 2020. And then surprisingly, and I would say shockingly, we could see the number of complaints in 2022 with two months still remaining. Uh, you know, in this year, we have recorded a, almost 300 cases so far. And this is a big number for a country like Fiji. As I've already said, we have approximately, you know, 900,000 population. Um, Whilst we also have issues because, you know, we are working with policymakers to push, push for policy changes to, uh, and a lot of collaboration, rightfully, as Eric said, that there's a lot of co collaboration is required from different stakeholders. And that is where we see, you know, it's lacking and a lot of work is being done in this space and Consumer Council is pushing for it. Uh, and we continuously advocate for introduction of policies and legislation. Uh, and, and two, we try and consumers to become more uh, knowledgeable and take proactive measures to protect themselves while using DFS um, services. So, um, you know, whilst, you know, we're trying to mount uh, advocacy compa uh, the, the campaigns, but there are certain, you know, challenges that we are facing whilst we are trying to push for this. This is resource constraint, uh, lack of uh, collaboration by financial institutions because what we have seen is that sometimes financial institutions feels that talking about such issues might degrade their image. Um, and they, in Fiji, there's also lack of uh, digital financial experts. Um, you know, consultants come and go and then there's a big gap. And as I said, there's no national policies to protect uh, uh, consumers and consumer digital uh, um, in the digital financial space. So, um, you know, as Consumer Council, you know, what we are trying to do currently is that we have implemented a lot of projects uh, and the major one being, you know, how can we get close to the consumers? So what we have done is uh, during COVID, this is the time when a lot of people moved on to DDFS. So we tried to, um, you know, develop a mobile app that enable consumers to lodge complaints from the com comfort of their homes. So why is this absence of policies? But what we are trying to do is we're trying to provide with them a platform where they can raise their grievances and the Consumer Council of Fiji assist, to, uh, assist them to obtain a redress by working with different regulatory um, um, agencies like the Central Bank of Fiji, um, the uh, Fiji Commerce uh, uh, the Fiji Consumer Competition um, Commission and other, you know, relevant authorities, the ministries as well. So uh, we also have a, a you know, uh, a special tab where consumers can use financial, uh, large financial complaints, including digital finance through the mobile app. Uh, we also have a new website which has been just uh, developed a few months ago, which enables compla uh, complainants to lodge their complaints through that so that, you know, um, if they are losing a lot of, uh, um, a lot through the digital financial space, you know, some form of assistance can be provided to them. And, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, Fiji is not spared. Uh, the cryptocurrency, the Bitcoin, whilst it's illegal for the Fijian citizens, to, to actually bid for that. Uh, there have been a lot of, um, you know, scams going around encouraging uh, the people of Fiji to actually participate on that. So what we are trying to do mostly is to um, raise a lot of awareness uh, through different uh, ways. We also have a research and debt management um, division at Consumer Council of Fiji. Um, what we do is uh, we try to step up our game in terms of advocacy. As I said, we create a, a aggressive awareness on digital financial issues whilst we are waiting for policies to be developed and implemented. Um, the debt management and credit advisory team reaches out to students in primary and secondary schools, tertiary students, villages and communities, because we feel these are the very vulnerable people who are losing out on thousands of dollars to the scammers. Um, and also workshops are 
are being conducted with businesses involved in DFS, including banks and mobile money platform providers, to highlight issues, to recommend on consumer-related or centered practices and promote consumer rights. Uh, currently, you know, uh, we have an M-Pace plot platform, which is an e-mobile uh, wallet. So we could see a lot of scams are going on in that area too. So we are trying to involve the, the uh, mobile money providers to come up with a way they can protect the, the, the customers, you know, because people are losing out a lot. And um, uh, the Consumer Council is also, you know, forcefully pushed itself to be part of the steering committees, which is instrumental in making policy recommendations and dis decisions in the DFS uh, space. For instance, we have strongly insi insisted and successfully been appointed in the steering committee on consumer protection and financial capability working group. Res uh, this group is actually not only responsible for aggressive advocacy, but also shaping policies relating to digital payments. And this is spearheaded by the Central Bank of Fiji. Um, and as I, and as we all might agree that advocacy is not only enough, it's not only consumer's responsibility, but you know, uh, the as, as rightfully uh, Eric has said, it needs collaboration uh, from all different stakeholders. So we have also made submissions to our policy makers, which is our ministers in this uh, case, outlining the woes of the consumers in the digital um, finance sphere. And we have strongly recommended to introduce various policy uh, mechanisms to protect consumer interest and bring about, you know, um, redressal mechanism. Um, so we believe that, you know, representing consumer voice in steering committees where decisions are made, introducing policy mechanisms uh, coupled with rigorous advocacy, we will be able to shape the um, digital financial sector in Fiji that can promote and protect the consumer rights. Um, so this is, I think this is where I would like to stop. And I'll be happy to um, answer any questions that follows after you know, the presentations. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Sima. It's, it's interesting that you brought up uh, steering committees. I know uh, Saroja is, is part of quite a number of those and we are keen to learn along the year how being part of these committees has been influential in changing a policy or enacting frameworks that are very consumer centric. So we do hope to follow up on that as well. Uh, Saroja coming to you. I do know that the Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group published a study of general consumers across 30 districts in India to understand some of the consumer's perspectives and experiences while interacting with digital financial services. Uh, can, can you kindly share uh, briefly what the research was about and highlighting for us some of the consumer preferences in digital finance solutions so that we can be able to see how best, uh, what the consumer says, but also how best to, to align some of the services or solutions we advocate for to be in line with what the consumers need. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sheila, and thank you, CI, for inviting me to this important discussion. So, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the objective of the study was to understand consumers' perception of digital finance in terms of inclusivity, uh, data protection and safety, and grievance redress. And so, um, it was in the form of a questionnaire, a Google form, and uh, covering the state of Tamil Nadu that I come from in India. Uh, and uh, uh, with a participation of around uh, 300 and sorry 3650 uh, 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 members and we did a um, uh, it was a random sampling method was followed so um, uh, so some of the few um, uh, key findings were actually like major of majority of them had heard about uh, digital financial services but only around 60% of them used them actually and the 40% who didn't use stated the following reasons actually they said they didn't like they, it was either that they didn't know how to use it they did not trust online banking platforms they were not feeling safe and comfortable using it did not have access to smartphone technology and so that was the reason they were not using it uh, illiteracy was also like or almost 13 percent of them said they didn't have a smartphone to actually uh, use digital financial services. Illiteracy amounted to around 9%. And uh, like there were people who also said they preferred to visit the banks in person to avail the services. 
and um, and also like when we asked about uh, and uh, uh, and it was like around 40% of them had started using the digital financial services in the last two years which or uh, which clearly means that covid should be the main reason for them having started to use it because the next question when we asked about the reasons for using first came like the facility it facilitates e-commerce transactions and then ease and convenience saves time and money all these were the reasons given and then there were a, another one question that we asked and we were very surprised by the responses about engaging third parties for transactions agents for trans transactions almost 48 percent were unaware that it was unsafe to engage other people to for your own transactions they said it they found it to be easy it was convenient for them they didn't need to step out it was uh, like it saves time if someone who knows it, it does it for them and for business purposes but they didn't they were not aware that it was unsafe actually and uh, when it comes to issues with online banking like uh, around 52 percent of them faced issues like uh, issues were around server connectivity delay or failure in refund double transactions money debited in failed transactions and the, these were the ma major complaints and they also there were also other issues like wrong transactions money lost <clears throat> lost in transit accounts getting hacked compromise on personal information difficulty in understanding the understanding the terms and too many distractions like pop up ads during transactions so these were all the some of the issues that the consumers told us when we asked them about the issues that they faced and with the next, when we ask the next question about how many of them approach the customer care for redress, 52 percent of them only said that they approach the customer care. The rest actually said they did, either they said they didn't know that they could that there was a platform available for seeking resolution, or they they didn't trust those platforms, and so they left it at that. Whatever the issue they faced, they just left it at that. Didn't actually do that kind of a, whatever issue they face they didn't get into that again kind of uh, a response and out of the 52 who said they approached 20 percent said they had a very bad experience uh, and that either the issue was not resolved or um, uh, like uh, uh, the uh, consumer uh, the customer care uh, did not respond give a proper response there was no escalation matrix they didn't know how to get it resolved didn't know how to proceed further and things like that. So this was the gist of the summer study. And the um, and following this, what it, we did was we had a consumer guidance seminar. So we invited civil society organizations, consumers who participated, um, a few of them from all the districts, we got them to participate. We had experts, we had the regulator also. There is a Bank of India, the banking regulator in India. We had a representative from that also attend this webinar and we presented our study. And we had experts speak on inclusivity and safety and all. And uh, the summary of the recommendations to the policymaker was that we needed a strong regulatory framework and a robust redress mechanism, which is very important. And uh, as far as for the consumers go, like definitely they, there needs to be more awareness amongst them on how to be cautious by transacting online, how to be aware of fraudulent messages, calls, emails, and uh, how to actually uh, identify phishing emails, how, how need to have complicated password and uh, uh, CVVs and whatever, and uh, uh, how to identify fake platforms. So all this to create awareness, we came up with a booklet to, uh, uh, to actually uh, uh, keep uh, educate consumers. So this was about um, uh, overall about our study, actually. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Saroja. Also interesting that some of the issues that are coming up are still across the board are also highly tied to awareness, especially understanding of digital finance services, but also the need to create trust. And I do know that uh, for, for our regulator representatives, usually in most of the countries we are working in, uh, once the regulator says something or they do something, these are people that usually consumers look up to and believe that as long as the regulator is inform, involved, whatever services are available are safe or trustworthy. And uh, coming to you, Frank, uh, what, what has, I know that currently, 
the, the report on, and as uh, Eric also mentioned, the digital innovations are moving way faster than sometimes the, the policies or regulations that have to be in place to ensure that these are safe. Uh, but what are some of those activities and policies that are put in place to ensure that our consumers are safe, especially when transacting with digital financial services? Thank you, Sheila. Um, as Eric said and my colleagues said, um, we are in a world that is evolving so fast. So uh, regulators are required to also act as fast as possible to make sure that they also work on the uh, risks that are emerging. Uh, particularly in Rwanda, we've been working on different uh, initiatives to make sure that we also go with um, the, the evolution of the digital world. Uh, and in last year, in March 2021, uh, the government of Rwanda uh, enacted a new law, uh, financial service consumer protection law, and among other things, it also established an independent committee that will be in charge of external dispute resolutions, and also mandated the central bank to be the supervisor of the consumer protection issues in the financial sector. And as a result of that, the central bank has been working on different initiatives to make sure that it executes its mandate uh, and among other um, initiatives that we're working on, uh, we have web completer that is enabling consumers to compare different prices of different financial products to make sure that they make informed decisions uh, where, wherever they are. It's a website where you go, if you want to take a credit, you just choose how much you want to take, and then the system is able to rank which one is going to give you at a lower price and which one is going to give you at um, higher prices. And uh, something else that we've worked on is a conference handling and customer engagement system, the chatbot. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence enabled chatbot that is centralizing all conference across the country where the regulator has an oversight and monitoring role. So whoever has an issue, he just lodges in using either SMS, web, WhatsApp, uh, voice feature, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, whichever. We have different channels where consumers can um, access the chatbot and then log in the conference against the financial institutions. And then the financial institution gets a, a, an instant a conference. And then the regulator is also uh, notified to make sure that they also intervene in case anything goes wrong. Uh, so we've worked also on the regulations. We also have a regulation on uh, management of internal dispute resolutions. We also have a regulation on um, consumer protection that details what the law was actually talking about because the law talks about the principles but the regulation details everything and um, we are also working on the supervisory framework where we will be supervising the implementation of the law so we've so far carried out different on-site inspections to check the baseline where the financial institutions are and going forward we shall be uh, making sure that we work with the different stakeholders. We're also working on establishment of the Financial Sector Conduct and Consumer Protection Forum that will bring together stakeholders to make sure that we always deliberate on different issues affecting uh, consumer protection. Now, specific on digital, we also have uh, a law on the e-money issuers. We also have a regulation on the protection payment service users that also talks about uh, a different uh, framework on how digital issues are managed. Uh, so at the central bank level, we are doing um, a lot of things, including awareness. We're working with different uh, stakeholders, including the Association of Consumers in Rwanda, to make sure that also um, facilitate us in, uh, I mean, increasing the financial interest because or among other different risks that we face, we're also facing uh, the risks of uh, consumers not being aware of the risks that are actually emerging. So we are doing a lot to make sure that consumers are aware of the emerging risks, most especially as a result of increasing usage of digital financial services. So we are also uh, encouraging uh, financial, um, I mean, the, uh, the Consumers Association to also participate in the regulatory frameworks. We don't want to sit down and come up with regulatory frameworks that are not actually responding to the issues that are on the market. So we involve them to make sure that they also take part on behalf of the consumers and we make sure that we develop a holistic 
uh, regulatory framework that responds to the uh, issues that are affecting financial service consumers here, particularly in Rwanda. So uh, maybe I can stop here. I'll be ready to answer any other question that will come. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And it's, it's good to hear that you are engaging consumers to be part of the solution to some of the issues that they're facing in digital finance. And uh, we, we hope to hear more on that as well in the course of the, of the presentation and how it's sustainable or it's sustainably done to ensure that other consumer associations and regulators can also emulate uh, some of what you're doing. And uh, coming to you, Kesha, I know you've also been doing a lot of work in ensuring that uh, there are cohesive policies in place to ensure that the ecosystem, the digital finance ecosystem is sustainable. Uh, can you share briefly some of the measures you've put in place uh, around digital finance? Thanks very much, Sheila. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the concept of digital financial services being really fast evolving is something that's come up quite um, a lot today. And what we are uh, doing in South Africa is, is designing a conduct protection law for the financial services sector that is flexible and high level so that it gives us the ability to respond quite quickly um, to different types of business models, different types of um, services and uh, players that may enter the market um, without us having to necessarily go back and change laws or, or regulations, which can be quite a cumbersome process. Um, in doing that, we've recognized uh, that we want our regulation and supervision to be producing good outcomes for customers um, and that we should be doing more to measure directly what those outcomes are that customers are experiencing. So we can have great um, laws and regulations in place. We can have financial institutions that adhere to those laws and regulations, uh, but you could still have customers that are receiving poor outcomes. Um, and so some of the work that we're doing is to try and hear and incorporate more directly um, the views and experiences of customers in the work that we're undertaking. Uh, one of the projects that we undertook was to see what indicators we could be analyzing from the information that financial institutions give to us um, and analyzing that information to uh, paint a picture of what their customer journey is like with, with these institutions. Um, we undertook a pilot project and what was really interesting about that is in a lot of instances, some of the information that we're looking for is there, but it's sitting in different parts of the business and it's not being drawn together to give a clear picture of what the customer experiences when they first come into a business, uh, when they're interacting with that business or financial institution and what it's like when they may have issues to resolve. Um, we can look at complaints, but we know that's only often um, complaints are lodged when it's kind of a last resort for a customer. Um, and in some instances, they may not even feel like it's worth it to lodge a complaint because they don't believe their issue is going to get resolved. Um, so we're trying to look at what it is that we can get from other information that can give us a sense of what customers are experiencing. Um, and then the second thing that we're working on is to establish a consumer advisory panel as a more formal mechanism for getting views um, and, and perspectives from consumer representatives in our work. Uh, it's really interesting to hear about the organizations from Fiji and India that are taking a very active role in looking what, at what customers are experiencing. Um, South Africa doesn't have as strong of a, a organized consumer advocacy voice. Um, and so what we're trying to do as a regulator is put in place a panel uh, get representatives who can give us a sense of the collective consumer voice um, as it relates to financial customers, and then consult with them when we're developing policies, where, whether it's relating to open finance, digital financial services, we're working on uh, regulatory requirements in relation to crypto assets, consult with this panel, um, get a sense of you know, what customer perspectives and needs are in relation to these types of policies of, of the regulator. Um, and then also to have this panel be engaging with us and saying, we're aware of this emerging trend that's affecting customers. 
uh, is there a way that the regulator can respond, whether it is through direct uh, regulatory action or even through our consumer education um, initiatives as well. So I think that's also in addition to our regulation and our supervision approaches, um, another way to make sure that we are aware of and responsive to issues that consumers are actually facing in, in the sector. Um, also happy to stop there and I'd be happy to take any other comments and questions that uh, colleagues may have. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, thank you, Pasha. And uh, it's, it's glad to see that, it, it's, it's good to see that uh, the role of consumer advocacy, of organized consumer advocates has come out as that's, that's one of the key things that we've been seeing in some of the countries where the consumer advocacy voice is strong you see that usually these issues get get to the regulators faster because they're aggregated vis-a-vis -vis the segmented one-on-one -on -one, um, issues. I'll just, uh, before I go on the follow-up questions, I'll do I'll read some of the questions from the audience. We do have Jay Shri who asked, as the nature and type of frauds evolve, is there a way to limit consumer liability arising from fraud? Uh, she goes ahead to say, shouldn't FSPs and financial systems bear the risk, especially as digital financial services expand to include consumers that may not have the skills or capability? Uh, this was not directed at anyone, so uh, anyone is free on the panel to take it on. I, 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 I would uh, initially first pass it to Kasha and Frank, as you also usually regulate financial service providers to get your take on what you think uh, the role of financial service providers is in ensuring that we have a safe uh, digital finance ecosystem. Uh, over to you, Kasha, first, and then to Frank. Thank you so much. I think that's actually a great question and really pertinent when it comes to the, the shift towards digital um, and how to make sure consumers remain protected even when they're engaging through channels that are often a lot more efficient, they're cheaper, they're much more accessible. Uh, but I think the point was raised um, earlier as well. Uh, when financial uh, service providers are making these channels available to consumers, are they comfortable that consumers properly understand the, the risks that they may be exposing themselves to and how to protect themselves against those, those risks? Um, you know, if I think of uh, more traditional channels such as the uh, you know, through transacting through your bank account or credit card, uh, there are stop gaps that are put in place where the financial service provider will assume liability for um, certain levels of fraud that have taken place um, against a consumer's account. Um, I think there must be consideration given to as uh, financial service providers shift customers towards more digital channels. Um, where, where do the lines of accountability stop and, and start, um, especially when it comes to customers that may be much more vulnerable to, to fraud? Um, I know one suggestion that's come up is to say, um, if it is going to perhaps uh, lower income consumers, that there is actually uh, an automatic block on the extent to which funds can be removed out of an account at any one time. Um, so rather than putting that onus on the customer, um, make that an automatic feature of the account to say, um, you know, an amount over a certain, uh, 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 yeah, um, uh, over a certain amount can't actually be moved out of this customer's account in a 24-hour period or uh, without this extra explicit um, uh, security measure being um, implemented. Um, and I think that's where you can say if these safeguards still don't um, result in safekeeping, then where does liability lie uh, for fraud that, that may occur? Thanks, Sheila. Yeah, thank you, Kisha and, and Frank. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I will not go very far from what uh, Kisha said. Uh, for us, what we're doing is to make sure that uh, the infrastructure that have been put in place by the financial service providers actually are more safe and secure to make sure that um, we eliminate uh, all those kinds of risks. But again, we know that we cannot do it at once. So what we do, we also encourage uh, financial service providers to take part in educating their consumers to be uh, their own, um, to protect their own uh, login credentials. So, but again, um, what we do we, when, when, when a fraud happens uh, on digital channels, 
we also determine because sometimes we get involved. So we look at um, the role of the FSP. Uh, are, are they actually having the most secure and safe uh, infrastructures to protect the consumers? Uh, again, what is their role in educating consumers or the consumer aware of such kind of risks? And then after that, uh, de depending on the analysis of the flood, we may order a financial service institution to refund. But at the same time, we also, as I said, we are doing a comprehensive awareness campaigns, most especially on digital uh, financial services, to make sure that the consumers uh, be at the forefront of protecting their digital channels. Uh, in other words, we are starting with the consumers to make sure that they protect their own assets. But we're also um, putting in the regulatory framework to make sure that financial service pro providers are also playing their role in putting in place uh, safe and secure infrastructures that are enables uh, consumers to transact safely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Those those are really interesting inputs. And uh, ahead of the coming year, we are going to be doing more engagement within the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator with uh, businesses and industry. And we look forward to sharing some of these insights on how we can all collaboratively work together to ensure that the customers at the front in the design of uh, products and solutions for digital finance. Uh, we do have another comment from Joseph Irumba where he says, the regulators have been given reg need to be given regular updates as the evolution of financial digital uh, services also turns around. And with greater awareness and the new laws, this will help uh, consumers utilize all available resources. Uh, speaking to this comment, uh, Eric, uh, Sima, and Saroja, I know our CGAP, Eric, is, has played a key role on insight generation and coming up with uh, reports and research uh, that is useful to, to the consumer. Uh, to inform our uh, regulators. Is there, is there something more you can share on that around how we can promptly have these insights disseminated and this information reach the right channels? And uh, shortly after that, I'll come to you as uh, Sima and Saroja to see what role you've played around ensuring that these insights get to the regulators in time. Yeah, I think, you know, we've had some, uh, thank you, Sheila. I think we've had some very good examples uh, in this panel, actually. I think it's, you know, fascinating to hear from all my colleagues today. And, you know, the, the activities described by Kershia and by Frank in terms of, you know, reaching out to consumers and helping them better understand the situation. I think all this is absolutely, you know, critical. Now, um, if you want to have more details, uh, about consumer risks. That's where I also think that supervisors need to be even more proactive. Uh, and that also raises questions of resources because not all supervisors have necessary you know, resources. But I'm, I'm quite, you know, I was talking about this notion of developing an ecosystem uh, earlier on. I really believe that to start this process of developing this responsible ecosystem, it is important for us to have good national data on consumer risks. So what we've been doing in Ivory Coast, and we're doing this in Senegal with the uh, you know, local authorities, is putting in place national surveys that really analyzes at where, you know, what level are the risks. Like for example, uh, we find that, uh, you know, uh, women might be more prone to, uh, you know, be victims of frauds, for example, uh, at the same time, you know, they might be uh, stronger in terms of getting advice from the agent. So I think, you know, these kind of, um, you know, quantitative surveys, I find very interesting. I mean, this is also what Saraja was, was presenting for India. This kind of market intelligence, in my opinion, is we don't have enough of this at the moment. Uh, at the country level, I think gathering, you know, having representative samples, uh, of consumers that that can tell your story to the supervisor, so that you know where you have to watch. Uh, you know, is it more from you know from uh, the digital credits? What type of you know service is presenting more more for, for more uh, sorry risks to consumers than others? Which type of population is more affected? Uh, I think having more data and monitoring the markets even more proactively. I think will help a lot in finding the uh, 
the um, you know the solutions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric. I'll also come back to that uh, later. Uh, over to you, uh, Sima, on what you've done around uh, inside generation country or national insights uh, to enable uh, faster resolution or enactment of laws that are consumer friendly. Um, as I have uh, highlighted, um, Sheila, you know, um, just like uh, this, this is very important to have, um, you know, the national data as Eric has, and that's missing in our country. What actually we have is, you know, all the, uh, the, the issues that currently consumers are facing, and that is through the complaints lodged at the council, which is just like a tip of our, our, the iceberg, as I have alluded to earlier. On, however, we continuously keep flagging these issues to the central bank because you know we feel that they are instrumental in you know making policies and bringing about policies that really you know Im have impact and beneficial to the consumers in Fiji. So uh, we work very closely with them uh, to see how well we can work together to have you know um um. Uh, you know, policies in place or regulations in place for that uh, matter so that we can protect the consumers. Uh, what we actually have seen in Fiji, I mean, just taking Fiji, for example, uh, there are different platforms that uh, the digital financial providers are coming up with, but they're not ready to take any liability. And actually, they push those to the towards the consumers. Like, for example, you know, we have currently uh, a e-mobile um, a wallet platform in Fiji and you know a lot of people have lost thousands of dollars through scams so you know it, the the one time password is being um, even though the consumers are not sharing their OTPs but it's somehow the other the scammers are able to access and then they are able to you know um, transfer money from one account to the other and this uh, digital platform um, the, the e-mobile platform providers are not taking any liabilities and are keeping very quiet so in this um, you know in such uh, areas what we are doing is we are collating all this information and we are keeping the, the central banks in loop together with the um, the Fiji's intelligence unit who actually looks into scams, digital financial scams, uh, and, and we are trying to rope them in and see how well together we can work for, you know, to, to benefit the, the Fijians. Um, in, uh, so and, and you know everybody is moving towards digital financial uh, platforms now. It has become of of a thing now. You know people want to be on that, but how can we build that trust? That trust can only be built if we have involvement, a great or proactiveness from the central bank from that level, uh, from the policy makers level, and. Uh, you know, trusting is, is is part of the Pacific culture, and this is why a lot of people are losing money because they trust uh, these scammers more easily. They receive a call, they trust. Yes, we have won a lottery. Yes, we have need to you know transfer this much of money. So in this process, they get hacked. So um, um, this, I feel that you know the the uh, central bank needs to take a very proactive approach and uh, currently we don't we see that absence so we're pushing hard on them going hard on them trying to get involved and you know push for policy changes yeah thank you thank you Sima and uh, lastly Saroja before we we go to Kisha with another question from the audience yeah thank you Sheila I agree with Sima like uh, here in India also uh, we feel that the uh, the regulator should take a proactive step and they should actually act fast because today with the increase in the digital uh, financial transactions, I think we need to act really fast because consumers are losing their money and we need to have a robust redress mechanism. We need to have uh, like all these scams need to be tracked quickly. There should be quick action. Otherwise it's going to be very difficult. So they need to step up on their action. Um, like earlier, a few years back with the telecom industry, we faced similar issues. So we consumer groups, a uh, few of us are part of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India as members. And we give inputs, which has been taken very proactively by them. I would give them as the right example. And, uh, and they came out with several regulations, actually, which are pro-consumer today. And we don't get that many complaints about redress mechanisms or even the uh, so issues like unsolicited messages, of course, we do get, but then the 
numbers have reduced and there is a regulation in place to control all this and there are several systems put in place i think the regular the bank the bank this sector as well they have to step up they need to act on this and this is what we are asking them for and consumer voices need to be heard because we talk the what is happening on the ground we represent that before the regulators and i think it's very important that our voices are heard yeah yeah thank you thank you, thank you saroja and uh, you also happen to be on on some of those panels so it gives you great access to voice or share that such insights with the regulators and one last question before we close, uh, Keisha, there is a question for you. Uh, what are some, uh, a question for Keisha on the consumer advisory panel. What are some of the challenges that you foresee in getting a sense of excluded groups or consumer segments that continue to lack trust in financial systems? For instance, to tackle the, persistent, uh, the persistence of informal services, how are you addressing this in SA and what are some of the challenges you anticipate? Thanks so much. Another great question. Um, I think we are considering how to balance um, capacity building for consumer uh, representatives um, to make uh, to see the extent to which they are better able to then engage with the regulator, uh, but balancing that against the need for independence of a consumer advisory panel as well. We don't want uh, to set up an a engagement process that is seen to be biased towards the regulator. Um, and so other initiatives that we're undertaking to hear for, from some of the more excluded or undercapacitated groups include uh, direct consumer research. So we participate in annual uh, research that looks at levels of financial inclusion in the financial sector and some challenges that customers are facing. Um, and this year we are undertaking as the regulator our own customer sentiment study um, that will go directly to customers to hear their views and preferences for engaging with the financial sector and why they may pre uh, prefer informal versus formal provision of services. Thanks. Thank you, Keisha. And uh, just a few last comments from the audience. We do have uh, we do have Eunice Mwende who is saying great initiatives on con and consumer awareness is key to ensure last mile communities are made aware of the risks in place in a language and manner they understand best as the risks evolve with each new innovative way of transferring assistance uh, using cash. And then we do also have another comment from Sarah Ward who's um, building on to Eric's point of as we gather data, where the analysis of the data to gather risks, who and at what level this is understood by regulations or institutions, and uh, more on the specificity of where we think there is a missing level of understanding. And also she says great initiatives um, from Rwanda, India on uh, investment in data. Uh, we do have uh, two minutes to close. And with that, I would just love to wrap up. And uh, some of the key takeaways are a lot of awareness that's needed, uh, especially ensuring that this awareness reaches the cost customers and the consumers, not just on the products, but also on the risks that uh, these products come with. Uh, there has been a lot around uh, building trust, around digital and financial literacy. We are still yet to see a lot of evidence on the impact of these, but it has come up over and over again as a big issue the importance of using market intelligence and market monitoring tools, and um, the importance of building the capacity of all the people within the ecosystem to understand these issues. But uh, most importantly, the urgency for us to collaborate and to work together as all key stakeholders within the ecosystem. Uh, you've all mentioned something around the capacity and without, if each of us play our part, I believe that we can be able to escalate uh, in ensuring that we mitigate some of these risks that are coming up. Thank you so much to our audience and to our amazing panel. It's been really amazing and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Please feel free to continue reaching out in case of anything and we shall reach out as well. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the events. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.